We've, uh, for the last, or for, for the next few months, we're going to be going through the book of Acts, right? It's going to take us like a whole year to finish it. But not today. Today we're not doing that. We're going to be taking a little break for Christmas. We're going to do two weeks of a break for Christmas. So it's, uh, it's Christmas time. We're no longer in the book of Acts. Uh, so who loves Christmas? Do you love Christmas? Y'all are so excited about Christmas. I love it. Yep. Um, what do you love about Christmas? Being a family. Being a family? Presents. Mm. Presents? Food. Yeah. Food. <laughs> I also love food. Uh, that's actually the, uh, <coughs> the first thing I have here is, uh, is food. People look forward to food at Christmas time. I know what you're thinking. This looks like Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, and it's because some crazy people in the world like to do turkey for Christmas like they do at Thanksgiving. I don't even like doing turkey once, much less doing it twice. When I was growing up, we used to do ribeyes. Mm -hmm. And that is a Christmas tradition I can get behind. Mm -hmm. But turkey twice a year, not my thing. But yeah, people look forward to food. What are some other things people look forward to? Presents. Presents, yeah, presents. People also like to look forward to snow. That's what Coco looks forward to. She looks forward to snow. Um, she loves it whenever it snows. I, this year, uh, or last year, sorry, we went to uh, the Kansas City Chiefs game. And I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but it is the coldest I've ever been in my entire life, which says something, right, Jamie? Um, so I'm looking forward to like a nice 90 degree day winter. Um, that'd be great if, if Christmas just stayed like it is right now. Nice. This is nice weather. Um, I'm all right with taking a year off from the snow. Um, you also said another thing people look forward to is presents. So I'm going to take this opportunity to congratulate Ben, who obviously yes. had the best. <laughs> Uh, snowman box every oh. year. Um, and even if Josh had managed to steal all of the, the votes, um, this still, hands down, would have been the best. That uh, was <laughs> But uh, yeah, people look forward to presents. See, when I was a kid, uh, actually, not when I was a kid, when I was in high school for a couple of years, my dad made us wrap our own presents and put them under the tree. That's rude. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. so rude. Yeah, it would sit under the tree Let's for two weeks, and I wrapped no. it. And so I knew exactly what I had. Oh. I knew. He took us Christmas shopping with him. Like, we went and picked oh. out the presents, <laughs> put them in the basket. Then we got home, and he said, no, y'all go wrap them and put them under the tree where they sat for two weeks until Christmas. I like you. No, Let me tell you, you do not want to know what you have for Christmas. Oh, I didn't know what I had. The anticipation of just being able, just seeing what you know is there. It's brutal. And let's shock my brother. He forgot. And so it really was a surprise for him. Was I don't know how he forgot. So. He forgot. Somehow he managed to forget. That sounds like Caleb. But it, yeah. presents create this anticipation for Christmas, right? Everybody's yeah. anticipating. Uh, I also like Christmas decorations. Christmas decorations are fun. I've not seen a house like this in real life, but I would love to. Um, I like going around looking at all the money people that's all, all the money that people spend. It's crazy. I don't spend that much money. Um, but uh, we love to look at these things, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it that there's this anticipation for Christmas? Why do we love Christmas so much? Is it just because we like Christmas music? Because no. Christmas music starts playing in like mid-September now, I think. It just uh, starts right after Halloween. It does start right after Halloween. They don't even take time to talk about turkey. No, they're like Christmas is next. <laughs> We don't like turkey, so it's okay. <laughs> Nobody likes turkey. Like I'm convinced turkey. of that because we only eat it once a year. I like turkey. We don't eat, yeah. Um, is it because it's because we get to get together with all of our family and travel and do all these things at Christmas? Do you think that's why there's all this anticipation? Maybe. Maybe. But usually travel is stressful. We we all traveled this year, and travel was stressful, right? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. So travel is usually pretty stressful for a lot of people. So I don't think it's that. Is it because we know that presents are coming? Possibly. Yeah, that's possible. Not. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Uh, is it because people tend to be very generous and giving around this time of year? Possible. Possible. I would say during Christmas, there's always this joyful anticipation. It's always being ramped up. Like Ben said, it's starting in October, right after Halloween. Usually Halloween's not even over yet, and you're already seeing Christmas decorations out, Halloween candies for sale, and now they have Christmas candy, and there's just this build-up, this ramp-up from Halloween 
all the way until Christmas Day. You go to ABC, they got their 25 days of Christmas going on. They got all these Christmas shows. People are having Christmas parties. Santa's at the mall. Everybody's drinking eggnog and it's merry and it's a great time, right? But it's this big ramp up and it, everybody's getting excited for this one day. And then the next day we're taking out all these Christmas decorations and going back to normal life. Um, but I would say as believers, when we see this day coming, there should be even this greater anticipation, this greater joy than what the rest of the world has. The rest of the world has lots of joy and anticipation coming for Christmas. But for believers, it should be even more so. Um, and this has always been the case for Christmas season, uh, for the Christmas season. Um, and when I say the Christmas season, I mean Advent. I mean the coming of Christ. I don't just mean like the holiday Christmas, but actually the coming of the Messiah. Even when times were tough, God's people knew the Messiah was coming. They were hopeful. Um, the, the promise of the coming Messiah brought them great joy when they were even in times of great distress. It served as a reminder that this wasn't where they were going to stay. Um, and this is what we're going to be looking at today. If you look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Um, as Christmas was approaching this year, I wasn't really excited for it. I've got my brother, and he's got a baby, and he's going to Austin. My sister, she is actually coming down here, but my family's all split up, and some of them are going to Clarendon. And I thought this would probably be the first Christmas that I'm going to be alone, which is pretty depressing, right? Yeah. yeah. But instead, I'm going to I'm going to Emerald with you guys. I'm going to the Uh, but but just the thought of like having to spend a holiday alone is just depressing. And a lot of people, that's the reality. They spend holidays alone. Um, and I, I mention that because I think something like this verse today could be an encouragement to people like that. Uh, before we dive into our text, let's back up to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 21, it says, They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, and will turn out that when they are hungry... They will be in, enraged and curse their kings and their God as they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. Um, so let's give some context here. What's going on? This passage was written roughly um, in uh, uh, roughly 700 years before the birth of Christ. So that's a long time. That's like three times longer than America's been here. But this is a really, really long time, uh, 700 years. Um, Israel was split up into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom. Uh, and as Isaiah was talking specifically to the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom had been disobedient to God. Later, the southern kingdom will follow, and it says you followed like your sister, and the southern kingdom was destroyed. Um, and because of that, the Assyrians were going to rise up against them and take them into captivity. So obviously Babylon, um, they, like I said, they would do the same later, but uh, 200 years later, but Isaiah specifically was talking to the northern kingdom here. Captivity for Israel was always a horrible time. They were mistreated, they were enslaved, some of them were killed, some of them died of starvation. And worst of all, the worst thing for all of them was that they were away from their promised land. They were away from where God's presence was. If you read the book of Lamentations, it's a series of laments from Jeremiah at the destruction of the temple and at the siege of the southern kingdom, when the southern kingdom fell. This is how the people of Israel felt, being taken out of their, their promised land, being taken out of the people of God. God's people not being in the promised land was sorrow upon sorrow from them, for them. As Isaiah, as Isaiah says, it was distress and darkness and gloom of anguish. And this is something the people of Israel faced time and time again in their history. Time and time again. Whether it be when they were in Egypt as slaves, and God brought them out of Egypt. Then they, they were in good favor with God for a long time, and then we see the Assyrians, we see the Babylonians, we see the Greeks, then the Romans. It was this gloom and distress. It was, it was sorrow upon sorrow. Um, pretty much any country that brought it 
that, that took them over would bring in their idols, would bring in their false gods, and they would force Israel to worship these things. This is what we see during the 400 years before, between the two testaments, the Old and New Testament. Um, if you study into that time, they're bringing in these false Greek gods and they're, they're threatening the people of Israel and saying, we'll kill you if you worship your God. And so this is happening to them time and time again. But their sin had led them to be judged by God. That's what led them to this time. It was their own sin that led them to be judged by God. Their, their, their uh, gloom of anguish, it was all brought on by themselves. Yet in the midst of this judgment that was coming on them, in the midst of this announcement of coming judgment, they are even given a promise. They're given hope. And that's where we pick up in verse 1. In verse 1 it says, But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on you. You shall multiply the nation. Oh, you will shine on them. Sorry, stop there. Verse 2. Isaiah points a, paints a great picture here for these people in distress and anguish of what is to come, of what their future hope is, of what their promise is. In earlier times, this is talking about Assyria taking over the captive, uh, taking captive the two tribes, specifically talking about Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. That's what we're talking about there. In later times, it's talking about a time in the future when the Messiah will come to these two tribes. So the question is, do we see that happen? What do you think? Do we see that happen in the New Testament? Yes. We do see that happen. We see it happen in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. It says, <coughs> now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth. He came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun, and <coughs> this was to fulfill what, the, what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land of the shadow of death upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So later times is this future event, this Messiah coming to these two tribes. God had a plan for his people, a plan to redeem them. It's in, it's in texts like this that we see the reality of Romans 8.28, that, that, God, that God causes all things to work together for the good, the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. This is a reality that we see. God had a plan for these people, even in their punishment and in his, his leaving them and letting them go into this gloom and anguish and darkness, he had a plan for them. As Jeremiah points out to the people of Judah, God had a plan for them. He had a plan to give them hope and a future. Going into captivity isn't the end for the people of Israel. Going into captivity wasn't the end for them. They had a hope, something to look forward to. The Messiah was coming. In our lives, there are certainly times of anguish. Times where we feel like we're in sin and darkness. Times where God has given us over to our sin as he did with Israel. We're promised trials and tribulations all throughout the Christian life. But we're also promised hope. There is hope for those who are in Christ. There is hope for those in distress. When, when the gloom of anguish seems too much to bear. I pray we remember the coming of the Messiah. Remember that God is good. Remember that God calls us all things to work together for the good of those who love God. May we also remember that this isn't the end for us. The Messiah is going to come again one day and all the wrongs will be made right. He will wipe away every tear. He will be in the, we'll be with him for eternity where every day is better than the day before and there will be no more sin, no more shame, no more death, no more destruction. All that's broken will be fixed and all of creation will worship the one true God. But how often we forget this. How often we, we forget that, that, that this isn't the end for us. How often we think that, that our, current, our current situation is so horrible and we forget what's to come. We let our current place blur our vision for the eternal. 
and, and for what we have to look forward to. And for that, we have much to confess. So let's stand and go into our time of confession. I'll read the words in white, and you'll read the words in yellow. <coughs> Lord God, we confess to you and to one another. We have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved you. We have not loved the neighbors and ourselves. We have not always had the mind of Christ. We have grieved you by wasting your gifts and by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, and free us from our sin. That's my man. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Praise be to God. Keep standing when I sing. Y'all go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> Open your Bibles back to Isaiah 9. We're going to finish by looking at verses 2 through 7. Bloom to glory. Um, let's do a little recap here, looking at verse 2, starting looking at verse 2. So people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So we'll start where we left off, because I believe it's an important place. First verse 2 is the start of this poem, this coming of the Prince of Peace. And you don't start in the middle of a poem. You will start at the beginning. Um, and I know a lot of us, our OCD won't let us start in the middle. Um, but second, as, as, we look at, 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 uh, as, as we look at earlier, this is a prophecy that was fulfilled. Christ, he, he goes to these lands of darkness, specifically the land of Zebulun and the left, land, land of Naphtali, lands that were formerly under judgment. And Isaiah and Matthew both, both describe this as light in the darkness. A glimmer of hope in their time of gloom and distress. And this is also the start of Jesus' ministry. This is where, like, uh, like we see in Mark chapter 1, Jesus, he just goes in, he goes in and he's saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We saw that back in, when we read Matthew. He's gone into this land of darkness with light, and he's saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, just like he did in Mark chapter 1. He's calling them to be a part of the kingdom of God. Now some people may say, well, that's weird. They're, they're people of Israel, the Jews, God's chosen people. Wouldn't that mean they're already in the kingdom? The answer is no. Just because they're Jewish people doesn't mean they are in the kingdom. Paul tells us that not all who are Israel are true Israel. Jesus tells us in John chapter 10 that... that uh, he has sheep that are not of this fold. And if we go all the way back to Abraham, God promises that Abraham will be a father to a multitude of nations. So the people of God are not just one specific people in one specific region in the Middle East. The people of God are God's people everywhere. Isaiah here gives us a glimpse um, in the following verses of what this kingdom is to look like. Now we have who's in this kingdom, people from every tribe, tongue, and language, as is promised in Revelation, and um, like, we, like we see with fulfilling of uh, Abraham going to be the father of a multitude of nations. We know who's in the kingdom. Now, what is this kingdom going to look like? Let's look at verse 3. Verse 3, it says, You shall multiply the nation, and you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. So this is a time of rejoicing. God's people are rejoicing. They're, they, they're, they have great joy because they're part of this kingdom. Not only do they have the great joy because they're part of this kingdom, but, but Isaiah paints two pictures here um, in, uh, in verse 3. Uh, the multiplying the nations and uh, the joy of the Lord. So first let's look at the multiplying the nations. What is Isaiah saying? Well, he's saying the same thing that God told Abraham, that Jesus says in John 10, and that Paul tells us in Romans. That there are more of God's people that are not just in Israel. The kingdom of God is made up of people from every tribe, tongue, and language. God will multiply his nation. It's going to grow. We see this promise in Daniel, that there's this chunk that's going to hit this stone, and it's going to crumble all of these empires, and it's going, to be, it's going to grow to be a mountain that covers the entire earth. 
He, was pr he, he has promised to do so. God will multiply his nation. And the second ends by letting us know, and, and the, the end of this section ends by letting us know that the zeal of the Lord of the hosts will accomplish this. These things are going to happen. The second thing he talks about is the joy of the Lord. And uh, in, in, in talking about the joy of the Lord, he gives two analogies. One is the gladness of harvest, and one is glad when, the, when, when the, they divide the spoils. Gladness of harvest and glad when they divide the spoils. Gladness of harvest is something that most people, I think, in 2023 don't really understand, but I think here we kind of do, because we live in a farming community. We have harvest festivals. Um, we, we recognize that God has provided, um, especially with like dry land farmers like BL, they're dependent on God to send rain to grow their crops. Um, and so we have these harvest festivals every year to celebrate what God has done, that God has provided for our needs, that he's given us vegetation from the ground. In the kingdom of God, we should have joy like that. Joy in celebrating what God has done. God has provided a sacrifice for our sins, and he's made us right before God. He's become the light in the darkness, to steal from Isaiah's earlier analogy. That's what God's done. We should celebrate that. We should have great joy in that. This gladness of harvest kind of joy. But then the second analogy he gives is glad when they divide the spoils. This is talking about victory. This is talking about um, similar to if you if you watched uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, whenever it was always winter, never Christmas, and then slowly the winter is just going away, and they're moving across the land. And as they're moving across the land, they get to meet Santa, and they get all these presents, and then they go to war and battle, and they defeat the White Witch. This is what's happening here. I'm putting here. This is this is like the big celebration we're going to have whenever Caleb and stay. <laughs> This is like his whole class is going to have. They're going to, they're going to pass around the trophy and everybody's going to celebrate. They're all going to share in that. In battle, in the old times when war was over, the people would divide up the gold, the land, the crops, the livestock. They would share in the victory. It was this great celebration when the battle was done. So what are we, what are we celebrating? What's been done? Well, he tells us in verse 4. Verse 4, for, for you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as, is, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. Christ has defeated his enemies, as Paul says in Colossians 2. When you, uh, in Colossians 2, it says, um, when you were dead in, the, in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was the ho which, which was hostile to us. And he was taken; he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So first, we see in that verse, he's justified us; he's made us right before God. <coughs> We see that he's, he's paid the punishment for our sins, but also we see he's defeated every power and principality. He's broken the yoke placed on his people. This would be the burden brought on us by ourselves, whether it be by, by, by our own minds and thinking we, we can't be made right before God. Um, this would be uh, also people telling, telling others to obey man-made laws. He's broken that burden. This would be like false teachers telling us we must deny the law to be saved. Or even that, that voice in the back of our own heads telling us that we're not good enough. He's, he's broken all of those burdens. Christ has defeated them. He has conquered it all. And he's done it in his own power like he did in Midian. Like he did the Midianites. This is referring back to Gideon in Judges. Where we had this great big army and he slowly brought it down the 300 men that took on all of the Midianites. He made that happen. The, the Israelites didn't do that. It was by the power of God that they won. When John Piper talks about this section, um, I think what he says is really good. When Isaiah says, 
For every boot of the booted warrior for the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be, will be for burning, fuel for the fire. Piper believes this relates to Romans 8.35. <coughs> Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it, as it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, <coughs> will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we look throughout church history, great persecution often didn't hinder the church. But in fact, it emboldened them. When we're going through the book of Acts right now, right? There's great persecution, even as we move further through the book of Acts, there's going to be great even greater persecution on the people of God. And did it stop them? No. They kept moving forward. They kept doing what Christ told them to do. We see it even later in church history when we look at like the Reformation. People of the Reformation, they kept doing what they believed Christ told them to do. They went back to what the Bible says. And it cost them their lives. But they were emboldened. They moved even further forward. As it said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. This persecution is used, used as a fuel to a spreading fire that will reach every tribe, tongue, and language. And the, Lord, the, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is part. This is the part that we get to uh, take. This is the part that we get to take part in as believers. We are plundering the enemy's goods. He has, defeat, he has defeated every power and principality. The strong man has been bound. He's been defeated. Satan has no more place. Christ has made a public spectacle, spectacle of him, and he sent us out to gather and pick up the mess of the war. He sent us to gather and pick, pick up those that have been deceived. The nations for a time belong to him, and it's all Christ now. It all belongs to him. This is like a, this is like if you read um, if you read Lord of the Rings, the end of the Return of the King, the ring has been destroyed. Frodo comes back to the Shire. When he gets back to the Shire, he realizes there's still orcs and they're still under bondage, even though Sauron's been defeated. And the reason why is because this weakened version of Saruman had taken over the Shire, and he had his orcs and they were running things. And Frodo he saw it as his duty to rally the troops to remove these defeated rulers out of the city and set the Shire free. And that's what he first did. That's what he did. Our job is much the same. Satan has been defeated. This world does not belong to him. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Christ. And now we get to be like Frodo. We get to rally the troops. We get to remove false rulers from our own land and put it under the feet of the king. That's the part we get to play. So let's, let's take part in that. Let's do that. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So Jesus has established his kingdom. It's growing to the ends of the earth. It can't be stopped. And now we need to know what kind of ruler is our king? What kind of ruler is he? When we talk about Jesus and his, and his disciples or even the people of Israel, we often, we often talk like they didn't know what the Messiah would be. Like they didn't completely understand it. We talk like they misunderstood something. And in the way they did, they seemed to think he would be like David. If David slayed his tens of thousands, then the Messiah would slay millions. We typically follow this up with they, they didn't know this, what this Messiah would be, what, what kind of ruler he would be. And then we talk about Jesus as if he wasn't a ruler at all. Like he wasn't actually a king. But, but he is. That's not what we see here. Obviously we have seen this ruler that has beat his enemies. And he's beat them so bad that he even uses them to grow his kingdom. But in what but in what the Son will be called, we, we see more of 
what kind of ruler this son would be. We see that he's a wonderful counselor. He's a wise ruler, wiser than Solomon, wiser, wiser than all the men in all of the kingdoms of the earth. We see in passages like Isaiah 2 or Micah 4, we see that the nations are actually going to come to God for wisdom, much like they did Solomon. We see that he's a mighty God. We see that he's not to be messed with. He's both strong and he is God. That's important. We don't want, we don't want to miss that. We don't want to miss that the son to be born is fully God. We see the hypostatic union right here in this, in Isaiah. We see that he's everlasting father, which is confusing. We don't want to get that confused. Isaiah is not saying that Jesus is the father, but he shares the traits of the father. Traits like that he's caring. He knows his sheep. He provides for his sheep. He gave his life for his sheep. He's caring to his own. And in that, he's like his father. This is similar, similar to Jesus saying, if you've seen me, then you've seen the father. We see in here that he's the prince of peace. If he's the prince of peace, what would this kingdom look like? Well, look at Isaiah 11 here. Isaiah 11, 69 says, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the, year, and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put his, his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this is what the kingdom of the Prince of Peace will look like one day. This is what will happen one day when the earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Until it looks like this, we still have much work to do. We still have a duty to our king. We still have a duty to make sure that the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth. He hasn't done that yet. We're still working towards that. Let's look at uh, verse 7 here. It says, There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. There will be no end to the increase of his government. His kingdom will continue to grow. Peace will continue to grow. Justice and righteousness will continue to grow. It may not seem like it now. It may seem like God's enemies are winning. It may, may feel overwhelming at times, but take heart. God has won. His son is on his throne. The strong man has been bound. The king is on the move. He's plundering the enemy's good. The meek will inherit the earth, and this entire planet will be a footstool for our God. As we approach Christmas, as we remember the coming of our king, I believe Isaiah wants us to know this. The prince of peace is ruling and reigning, and his government will know no end. Uh, we have a pastor friend in Houston. We were talking about this one time. He said, people often believe because these things seem, because things seem so bad right now, uh, we think that Isaiah's passage should just happen instantly. Like once we're in the kingdom, that should happen instantly. However, the kingdom growing to cover the whole earth takes time. It's much like our, our own personal sanctification. There are days that we seem to be doing really well, killing sin, being obedient to Christ. But there are other days where, where we, we seem to even question our own salvation. Our sanctification, it ebbs and flows, but make no mistake, you will be made look to look like Christ. The Lord will accomplish this. In the same way, Christ taking dominion over this world ebbs and flows. But make no mistake, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This whole earth will be his footstool. So know this, the Prince of Peace is ruling and reigning, and his government will know no end. The second, do this. Take heart and take action. Church, take heart. Though we may feel distressed, though we may feel like we're walking in darkness now, the king is on his throne, and his rule knows no end. All authority has been given to him, and he's given us the right to go out and plunder the enemy's goods. He told us what to do and how to do it. 
We're seeing this as we go through the book of Acts, the, the beginning of the apostles plundering the enemy's things. <coughs> the harvest is still plentiful, church. Isaiah 11 is not yet a reality, so we know we still have work to be done. Take heart and take action. God has made you specifically for these times. And he's put you in 2023, going into, going into 2024 for a reason. He knew what he was doing when he did that, when he put you in such times as this. Take heart, take action. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. Uh, I pray for your church, God, that you would continue to grow it. I pray that you would use us to make much of you here in the Pokemon. I pray that you would uh, help us to be obedient to your word. You would use your word to sanctify us, to make us look like you, and uh, that you would use us to make this town look like you. So Jesus, I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's stand and we'll